Uh, lovely, lovely to see you all here. My name is Opal Hope Bennett. I'm the senior programmer here at Athena Film Festival. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to year 10. Uh, we're a big kid now, double digits. <laughs> and of course, this is our last day, and we're super, super glad to present this panel on outreach and engagement for you. Um, before I bring up our uh, moderator, who will introduce the rest of the panel, I need to give thanks to all of our supporters. You've seen a bunch of them on the screen as you've been waiting here. I need to give a uh, particular highlight to our founding sponsor, Artemis Rising Foundation, and Regina K. Scully, who is the co-founder and has been a fierce advocate of ours since the beginning, uh, and our premier level sponsor, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Uh, they do a lot of work in science and have been super supportive of all of our programming around the sciences, women in the sciences and STEM. So thank you, Alfred Sloan. Uh, all right, it now gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, our panel's, panel's moderator, uh, Ellis Wadamanuk, who's Vice President of Impact Strategy at Play Motion, uh, at Picture Motion, excuse me. He's headed up campaigns for Won't You Be My Neighbor and We Are the Animals, and uh, prior to that worked at the theatrical division at FilmRise. Please welcome Ellis. Hey everyone, um, thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you for that intro, Opal. Um, I'm just gonna get straight to the point um, because we have some amazing panelists here and I'm honored to be um, on this stage with them. Uh, we're gonna kind of do bios in a second, so I'll just bring them up here. Please welcome um, Eliza Licht, Cynthia Lowen, and Erica Howard. Um, and just to get a sense of the room, Please raise your hand. Do we have any filmmakers in the audience? Wow, mostly filmmakers. Any producers? Awesome. Anyone just kind of in the audience outreach impact world? A few? Students? Awesome. Amazing. Um, so, so we are going to show a few clips um, and kind of talk about who we are and what we do, uh, have a conversation, and then leave some time at the end for some audience questions. Um, I think to get started, I would love to hear, um, Erica, maybe we can start with you, um, a little bit about who you are and if you could set the scene for the clip that we're about to see. Sure. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Glad that you are all here. Um, so I'm Erica Howard. I'm the impact producer for Frontline on PBS, which people may not normally associate with impact producing as an investigative journalism program, but uh, we've had very dedicated, faithful viewership for over 35 years, and there's this vision that we have of moving out into communities, uh, whether it's theatrical, non-theatrical, public programs, uh, to take that conversation that you see on television and bring it into real life um, uh, moments, like live events through impact campaigns. And um, I would say uh, to launch really that kind of work, uh, there's a film that we were part of producing called For Sama, a documentary that uh, I see a number of you are nodding your heads that you're familiar with, uh, but that film uh, was released in theaters last year and um, really uh, brings to life what had been going on in Aleppo, uh, which um, Frontline had produced about 12 films on Syria since 2011. And we found that in this film, it was told in a cinematic way uh, through a woman from Syria who's not only the director but starred in the film, how that was very, quote unquote, impactful in terms of raising awareness about what's going on there. And so we'll see a trailer now uh, for those of you who haven't seen the film. The <laughs> Halab, I'm Sama. 
سما عملت هالفيلم مشانك بدي اياك تفهم شو اللي كنا عم نقاتل مشانه بيضلوا كثير اليوم سما انا بعرف انك عم تفهمي شو عم بصير بقدر شوف هالشي بعيونك ما عم تبكي مثل اي طفل عادي هذا الشيء اللي عم يحرق قلبي سما رح تسامحيني Thank you, Erga. That movie changed my DNA. <laughs> It's so incredible. Um, one of my favorite of last year, so congratulations on everything. Uh, speaking of amazing films and filmmakers, um, Cynthia, thank you for being here. Do you mind maybe telling us about who you are and, and setting up you know, your clip? Certainly. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, my most recent film is a feature documentary called Netizens, which uh, I directed and produced, produced. <laughs> um, which is about women and online harassment. So the film follows three women who are targeted in unique ways. Um, things like revenge porn, um, non-consensual image exploitation, um, death threats, threats of um, you know, impersonation, violence. And I really made the film because there was kind of this epidemic of online violence and yet a lot of people were kind of of the feeling that it's not real, it's just the internet. And I wanted to challenge the idea that what happens online stays online. Um, and through really following these women's lives who um, every part of their lives are transformed by what's happening online. They um, you know, have safety concerns, they can't get jobs, they can't go to school, um, they can't date without having to account for what's happening to them on the internet. So um, we'll show a little bit uh, trailer from the film and then we created an impact campaign or I created in conjunction with, with a team Uh, to really kind of make sure that the film was getting out into the world in such a way that we could reach those people who are um, able to really make a difference on this. So in addition to shifting norms about what we accept as online harms, um, getting to policymakers, getting to tech companies, getting to educators, so that we could not only shift policy and tech responses, but we can also really shift how we expect online behaviors to occur. Do we anticipate violence online or do we think this is something that shouldn't be happening? So that was sort of one of the main goals with the film. Yes, sure. so I think we have a clip for that. For Anita Sarkeesian, this is the new normal. Armed escorts at public events, bomb threats, even death threats. So this is something that comes through the contact form on my website. These are tweets threatening a convention that I was at. This word legitimate threat, who is thinking about what is legitimate? If a company says we want to make this a safe space and a user says this is not feeling safe and the company comes back and says oh you're exaggerating, that's not good. I can't even go outside and show my face to the world anywhere. I can't go to school, I can't go to work because somebody has already seen me in the way that I don't want to be seen. Every time I give out my name, I know that I'm about to be judged because I know eventually they're going to Google me and they're going to see what's there and then they're going to judge me. They need to state their policy. They need to also inform the uploaders that they do not accept revenge porn. We're having conversations about civil rights today that are long overdue that mirror the conversations we're having about online spaces. I'm black and I'm a woman, and 
there's no reason why that should make me less able to speak my voice and able to be heard. Women are losing out in every sense when it comes to the laws that we have to protect privacy, to protect against harassment. New York doesn't have a revenge porn law because our politicians are doing nothing about it. This is not what the First Amendment was about. And I'm willing to go in and try to fight anyone saying that it is. <laughs> Can we get a picture with Please. you? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, how do you know yeah, who You too. <laughs> Cool. You watch my videos? Yeah. What I couldn't say is I'm angry. I'm angry that we live in a society where online harassment is tolerated, accepted, and excused. In all the different, messy, honest ways that we respond to harassment, we actually demonstrate how much humanity we all still have in the face of such cruelty and injustice. Thank you. Wow. The, I think the uh, the on, the issue of the online harassment of women is is so important and so powerful. So thank you for bringing that message out to the world. And it's is a nice way to transition over to you, Eliza. Um, you worked on the the remarkable Roll Up Roll. Um, so could you maybe introduce yourself and a little bit about um, what we're about to see and what you do and. Yeah, sure. <laughs> of course, my pleasure. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. I want to thank Opal for inviting me. I am actually a Barnard alum, and um, though I've spoken at Columbia, this is my first time speaking at Barnard, so that's exciting. Um, and I have been in the field of impact and engagement for not quite, but almost 20 years, um, and I spent 17 of those years at POV. Um, which is a documentary film series on PBS that really um, was one of the pioneers in this field, um, following in the footsteps of Ellen Schneider and Kara Murtis to really kind of figure out how these films can be used in communities, in classrooms, to kind of take that next step. So I worked on over 200 um, broadcast campaigns there, and then I left, um, and the first project I was so lucky to work on Nancy Schwartzman's film, Roll Red Roll. And um, that is a film that looks at the um, infamous 2012 rape case in Steubenville, Ohio. Um, and Picture Motion actually played a role. Um, we worked with Picture Motion on the, on the campaign as well. Um, and I will go into details on the campaign later. But for now, um, let's play the trailer. There's pressure to get these kids guilty. And even if they're guilty of rape, that they didn't do this and that, I hope, you know, that the truth comes out. When I first read this story, there wasn't a lot of substance to the article. Two high school football players had been charged just a couple of paragraphs about these two boys and that was it. I thought, this is nuts because that town is so entrenched in their football team. This is big news. So that's when I started snooping around. I had never seen a case constructed like this. That many people who have some information. This was a sexual assault with teenagers and the cell phones told the story. We had photos, we had 400,000 text messages. It was on Twitter, actually. Just the complete lack of empathy, that was what was so frightening. I mean, it was all out there. knew about it, if coaches knew about it, if a principal knew about it, if parents knew about it, why was nothing done about that? The question was, is this football town, you know, putting its daughters at risk by protecting its sons in a situation like this?
Thank you. So I think to kick things off, um, you know, this is a panel essentially about how to outreach and engage your audience, but, but there's so many words out there. There's engagement, there's impact. Um, you are all experts in this space. I would love to hear in your own words how you define engagement, specifically in 2020, where the landscape has changed so much. Um, Erica, maybe we could start with you. Sure, and I'll define it um, in a way that's really particular to Frontline, being that we're a journalism organization. Um, and so for me, engagement is really about um, making sure that people are truly educated and informed about the truth. I think we can take for granted in terms of what people know and understand about certain topics, uh, because there's so much that's put out there. But let's say for, uh, for, for some, which I'll talk about um, primarily through our discussion, is that uh, one of the things that we found was that as much as you would think that's been covered, it has been covered in the news, but how little people actually knew about the topic. This is incredibly important because in order to do any type of engagement, outreach, or impact, it first starts with that base of knowledge. What do you know and is it the truth? And so that's the heart of what we present is the truth, and looking at the fact that we're living in a post-truth America, um, especially, you know, that really, the advent of that started during uh, Obama's campaign, where all of these outlets sprung up, news outlets <laughs> sprung up uh, with pretty bad reporting, actually reporting lies, uh, and then that was blanketed that the media is just that way. So it's really important that whatever we do, that people are first starting with that base knowledge of what the truth is, and then uh, particularly uh, that folks then take it upon themselves to become civically engaged. Uh, Washington Post has this great tagline that democracy dies in darkness. And so what we want to do is to first create forums where people are informed and educated about what is truly going on with these very vital social and political topics, and then from there, they can decide how they're going to take a step forward to become civically engaged and be a part of our democracy. And Cynthia, I'm curious, particularly because you come from this as a filmmaker as well, um, what does engagement mean to you both kind of as you're making the movie, but then also when you're bringing it out, and do you have a different perspective there? I think that for me as a filmmaker, the, the impact begins in the telling of the story. And for both netizens and the film that I made uh, prior to that, I was the producer and writer on a film called Bully, which um, we had you know, a film that was seen by many, many, many young people in many different communities, not only around the United States, but internationally. Um, I think that the, the kind of how is this film going to really motivate people off the sidelines begins in those conversations where you're hearing about someone's story before you've even picked up the camera. You know, for me, I feel like if I'm listening to someone tell me what has happened to them, and my films tend to focus on things that, you know, make you feel kind of, you know, like mad. Like, this is not right. Like, we have to do something about this. And I feel like that kind of that call to action begins in those early conversations. I remember you know, having these conversations with parents about their children being stuffed in lockers and you know, left there for crazy periods of time and, and you know, coming home and, and finding you know, that their children had harmed themselves after these events and, and knowing that it had gone on for ages and no one had done anything about it. In a way, you know, that's where, for me, I think the impact begins. And, 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 and the drive to make these films is the drive to change the world for me. It's like, stories change the world. They can change the world. They can, they can make forms of violence that, you know, when Bully came out, there were people coming to us who were in, you know, their 70s saying, I went through this when I was in school. This has been going on for decades and decades and decades, and it was just normal. It was, you know, man up or kids being kids. And finally, there's a way of seeing this issue through a new lens. And I think that that's the power and potential of film is to take those things that were like, oh, that's just normal. That's bullying. That's just, there wasn't even a word for it there was a word for it, but it was rarely used. It was just life or middle school. Um, and, and a similar philosophy with netizens was like, 
I, I, I think the kind of gears started turning around making that film when, when I was hearing such similar things like, well, the, it's the internet, the internet's the wild west, or it's not real, or if you don't like it, get off, um, get offline. And those sort of attitudes of just like, well, that's just life, that's just normal, that's the internet, you know, you're gonna get death threats and sent all kinds of things or have your privacy violated. So um, being mad and wanting to tell a story, I think is a really good, <laughs> a good place to start with an impact campaign. Um, and these, these stories are such great opportunities for organizations and brands and companies and policymakers who are all like, oh, we have a message, we have this thing we wanna do, we want people to um, be more engaged, let's say, in violence prevention, or we want people to be more engaged in um, you know, reducing violence in our communities, and it's hard to get people engaged and, you know, reading websites or reading, you know, safety guides or reading, you know, how to be, how to, how to respond to, to things, be it online harassment, bullying, or any number of things. You know, when you, when you just see a film and you see those stories and, and have a different relationship with the subject matter, I think it catalyzes action in a really unique way. So Definitely. it like bums me out almost when, when, the, when great films get made that I'm like, I want to take action, and then there's not a campaign for them. Mm. I'm like, oh, what a missed opportunity. So I hope it continues to grow. And Eliza, how do you define engagement? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think a really great point from both of my fellow panelists, like number one, awareness, education, truth, learning about the issue in and of itself can be, you know, like for Nancy, I know when she was making Roll Red Roll, um, even in the beginning, it was like impact was built into the DNA. The, the crux of the impact campaign for that is that we're trying to get men and boys to step up and become involved and actually lead um, the fight against gender-based violence. And so she made the film in a way that really speaks to men and boys fast music, hard music. It's a thriller. It's, you know, so she like sort of thought about that from the beginning. Um, so for some, it's just watching the film. There's another film I'm working on right now that's actually at the festival. I don't know if anyone saw Abortion Helpline, This is Lisa. It's a really short, it's like a 12 minute piece. It's a really powerful film about um, women calling an abortion fund and explaining kind of why they need the money for an abortion. And it's juxtaposed with the Hyde Amendment, which is, you know, took away, um, Medicaid cannot pay for abortions and federal money can't go towards uh, abortion procedures. So it's sort of like, it's, it's a short. And again, both these films, I think, even the act of just seeing it engages you, most people, um, from the get-go, um, and then it's like, are you motivated and inspired to do something else? And the bar could be, talk to your, you know, your family about it at dinner, or ta tell your friends about it, share it on social media, and then it can go, you know, as high as, you know, setting up a screening, donating money to the abortion fund, and or, um, you know, policy change. So anyway, there's a whole realm, but like, yeah, it's all. <laughs> Yeah, I think... I think there's different levels, and yeah. Yeah, and it, it sounds like, I mean, all three of you kind of refer to this zeitgeist moment. Um, the word anger is interesting to me, that it's almost harvesting this anger that exists in 2020 America and turning that into action. Um, and, and you see this, this movement to kind of create impact has become much more grassroots. It's not happening in traditional film marketing. I'm curious about, can you talk about the the trends that you've seen recent, recently and how people are consuming this content and, and, and building action around these campaigns and, and why is that? Um, Cynthia, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm just, the anger thing got me. <laughs> it's actually funny, I don't think I've ever said this in public, but when I was little, I was extraordinarily shy and sort of meek, and my, but, I, but I had a complicated relationship with my dad and he would always say, stay angry. You know, he said, stay angry. Like, it it's, can motivate things. So I'm generally not angry, <laughs> but motivated. Um, you know, I think that I've, so I've had sort of the experience of trying to get a, a large distributor, and Eric and I were just talking about this um, prior to coming up here. I think that um, I wish that, that 
impact campaigns were more kind of really integral parts of the distribution plan, not just sort of like, hey, filmmaker, fine, if you want to like retain your educational and community rights, like that's fine, like we'll let you keep those and you can do whatever you want on the side and like let us do our, our thing and we'll try not to, just don't mess up our timeline with releasing your film and you know, have fun over there and you want to build some partnerships and have a website and do your community screenings, fine. Um, but I think that what, as a filmmaker, I really wish that distributors were really engaging in, and this is why I think it's so awesome that Frontline is doing this, is that I don't think it's happening enough. I don't think that you know when you're selling your film, you're able to say, great, fine, you're gonna pay for that. Like, what are you gonna really invest in impact on this? Like, really? And are you really gonna bring partners to the table with me? And are you really gonna raise a budget for me to, to make these plans a reality? And are you really gonna introduce me to the companies that I know you have relationships with to make this happen and open those doors for me? And I think that filmmakers should be um, more empowered to ask those questions of, of these large distributors who have, a, who have lots of resources and not a lot of bandwidth because we know how to get our, our films out there. We know how to be grassroots organizers as well as filmmakers. Distributors, I'm sorry, like they are, and not, not frontline, <laughs> but you know, distributors have a zillion films on their plate. You know, if you're like at a large VOD platform, they like, they're not gonna have the kind of resources and the long game to, be excited about getting this film into schools and communities, you know, three months after it's premiered on their platform. And what we're bringing to the table is longevity and creating something that's really evergreen and schools are gonna use this years after years after years or communities are gonna know about this and it's great for them. And they have, they have we're like their brain trust and we need to really, I think, get them, I would like, for them to be much more on board and much more integrated into the process that we're trying to forward to really make change. Just to touch upon yeah. what Cynthia was saying, I, I completely agree. Um, and just for those of you in the room who may not know the distinction between a traditional distribution company and those who do impact or impact, impact campaigns, is that traditionally with a distribution company, their primary concern is revenue that when a film is presented, whether it's theatrically or even non-theatrically, where they can charge a licensing fee, they want to be able to go into, let's say, a certain region to say that this film is premiering here and get as many people through the door to be able to do ticket sales and then also assure that that venue um, knows that the that their audience is not going to be cannibalized, right? And so. With that, a number of distributors can get very insecure about impact campaigns that will do grassroots outreach to different organizations, institutions, and networks that will generate other types of screenings, non-theatrical screenings, that could possibly take away from that revenue or that audience build through a particular release. And so with that thought that there is competition, there is the mindset of, impact or impact campaigns or outreach to grassroots organizations is bad until they want to utilize the relationship with grassroots organizations to then um, encourage people to go to the theater, right? And so there is this sort of tug of war that's taken place between the two entities, but in line with what Cynthia is saying, I do believe that the two can coexist very successfully. And then also the fact that uh, to be respectful of these grassroots organizations, that they're not just um, free marketing tools for a film, but they have a very vested interest in the topic at hand and should be respected for what they can bring to the table with very meaningful, purposeful conversations and then also moving the needle forward in a particular uh, topic or issue at hand that needs to have change brought to it. And you're right, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, especially at Picture Motion or any grassroots work, you know, we are often asked by a distributor, could we do field trip campaigns opening weekend? Suddenly that per screen average is going up. Suddenly you're getting more bookings, suddenly. And so it really does feed into each other. Um, that's a great segue into this idea of what is success, both maybe for us, but also for, 
for a distributor, or even as for a filmmaker. Um, that could be partnerships, that could be what is the meaningful change, what are these call to actions. Um, Eliza, what is a successful campaign for you? I mean, if you change, I mean, I, I do actually believe, if you kind of change one person's mind, like that is huge, right? Or if you open their, if you open their eyes to something or you make them see something differently, that's huge. Um, Every campaign I do, I make sure that there's audience evaluations, and sometimes reading those evaluations are just like the most uplifting, exciting thing in the world. Because, you know, you'll read some kids say, I never thought about this issue this way, or now I want to do X, Y, and Z. So that's one way. But I mean, it's also exciting when there's big, meaningful change. Um, and, you know, I'll go back to Roll Red Roll, which again is sort of like, the film looks at this one case, but it's really looking at the culture, the rape culture that let it happen, and looking at shifting the burden of changing that from the victims to the perpetrators to the bystanders. And so worked with um, your team actually to put together the audience evaluations for this um, and really targeted men and boys. Um, and. You, and um, the results were exciting in that, you know, 97% said that they um, had an increased understanding of what rape culture was, um, and 67% um, wanted to talk to their peers about consent, um, and 77% um, were want you know had a better understanding of, of bystanders and wanted to um, be involved in that. So I mean, just those sort of stats are really exciting. Um, also, what gets me kind of the most excited about this work is the long tail, kind of where the film is going to live and continue to do its work, kind of after we're, we're done with the big campaign. And so um, right now we're in talks with the NCAA. Um, that has mandatory um, sexual prevention trainings um, and creating a toolkit so that this could be used um, with the teams in the NCAA, places like that. So kind of finding those places, gets that, that's how I define success. Definitely. Yeah. And um, Erica, for Selma kind of took the world by storm last year. Um, <laughs> Could you talk about that campaign and what was, in your mind, what was your goalpost? What was success to you and how did you get there? Uh, I'll start by saying the goalpost was, first of all, getting people to see the film. Uh, to be honest, the fact that the war in Syria had been taking place for a decade and sort of had melted in with, you know, let's say Afghanistan, Iraq, how many people are having very meaningful conversations about, about what was happening there and also in the last six or so years, there were a number of films that had come out about Syria as well. Uh, Liza and I actually worked at POV together where there was a number of uh, Syrian films that were presented from Dahlia's other country. The war, um, the war show. show, thank you. Yes. Uh, last Men in Aleppo, um, Return to Homs, a number of them. And so the idea was, if we're going to present this film where Frontline had already done up to 12 at that point already to say, this is who Assad is, and most people are like, who is, who is President Assad? Then it was another film that would talk about the freedom fighters, the folks that were on the street fighting block by block. Then another film would talk about a family and how they're living out their daily lives in the midst of you know, um, all these different political factions that were coming in. And so after that, the idea of taking a film not just to broadcast, but actually to movie theaters, which is not an easy place to find success even when you have a star, so to speak, of a film. The idea is, are we even gonna get attention? And so, ultimately, what happened with the film was not even on our radar. We just wanted people just to see it and to understand this is what has happened in Aleppo and currently this is what's happening in another area of uh, Syria called Idlib. And so, in terms of success, we actually had that bar of just getting people to see it, and so everything else on top of it was just beyond what we could imagine. And just to you know, go a little bit, if I can just explain a little bit about the eco ecosystem in which the film existed and some of the things that happened with it behind the scenes. Um, and so, there's Frontline uh, through PBS, where we have our own um, 
way of releasing films onto broadcast and moving into the cinema realm. Then we worked with PBS Distribution, which is an arm of the greater PBS headquarters that specifically releases into movie theaters. And then we have a, a co-production partnership with Channel 4 News that's based in the UK, in England. And so all of us pooled our different resources to collaborate on this campaign. And I think some of the things, that, the high watermarks that I feel really, really good about uh, were, first of all, the communications aspect of the campaign. That there is a tremendous amount that was invested in the social media of going online and engaging with people in a digital way because then you can transcend. I mean, it's wonderful to get accepted into festivals, but our first festival was South by Southwest, which for any of you who have ever been to South by Southwest, that's not normally where you, pre you release the world premiere of a film that's about war. Um, and then to see that at that festival, the film won an audience award as well as the grand jury prize, we felt like, okay, we're on to something and really hit the ground running uh, with a social media campaign that um, really garnered a lot of people to follow film on, on um, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and then had a dedicated uh, website that was just for the film. So if you can imagine, the film had its own website page and then Frontline and Channel 4 News helping to support all of that. Um, and then from there, there's also the media amplification where, you know, Publicists are really worth their weight in gold to be able to break through all the other content that's going through and make sure that your film is getting coverage, um, whether it's in the trades uh, for you know Variety and Hollywood Reporter and those in Deadline and IndieWire, those areas, but also the news outlets that would not have otherwise taken notice. And so there was a great, a, lot of, um, a great amount of work that was done along those lines with the publicity aspect of you know, really taking these uh, moments where the, fin the film would win awards or get some type of attention to make sure to continually amplify that in the media. And that's also really important when you don't have a big budget for your film, that that can go a long way. Um, another aspect, that was really important that I saw was um, really the, the impact distribution part of things, where working in collaboration, um, and actually, you know, I'm gonna back up, that also the, the influencer outreach as well, where we were very mindful of taking a look at who within the country has that kind of national um, heft that if they should mention the film, that people would really take, take notice. And so we're very fortunate that as we pooled our different resources again to have interest from folks like Kate Blanchett, who then, uh, you know, months after her, you know, production schedule for a film was over, she had committed to do a screening and to talk about the film. She then very generously shared the film with her friends who are of similar interest and weight within you know, celebrity community, um, having interest from folks like Alec Baldwin, who covered the film as part of his This Is The Thing podcast, and um, was very wonderful to, you know, extend an invitation to um, the Hamptons Film Festival and, and led that discussion there. There is also um, Emma Clark from uh, Game of Thrones, after hearing that the director loves games, Game of Thrones, <laughs> that she also uh, put her weight behind it. But it wasn't anything that was on the surface. These people really meant well of, they, in their own personal work, even professional work, they had invested in this topic, in this area, and really saw how um, the film highlighted that, but also more, um, I would say, universal topics about what it is to be a parent in some very adverse circumstances. How do you navigate through that? How do you um, also create the sense of autonomy when your government is trying to literally kill you? Um, and so those touch points were really important as well as the impact distribution where we're able to, um, through different means, have the film shown at the UN. And uh, knowing that the, the UK mission to the UN was very supportive of still keeping Syria in the conversation at the UN. And so we're very fortunate that the UK ambassador to the UN gave opening remarks um, to the presentation and then afterwards was an instrumental in different um, 
introductions afterwards. And we saw that one week after the screening at the UN, that the UN Secretary General made an announcement that the UN would create a, start an investigation into the bombings of what was happening in, in Syria, especially against civilians and medical personnel. Um, another wonderful uh, partnership is with the Holocaust Museum in DC, where we took that opportunity to also reach out to members of Congress to um, invite them to that uh, particular uh, gathering. Um, eventually afterwards, we also had a screening at the State Department. Um, and that was really wonderful as well because they were, they were able to bring in 300 people midday to a screening and then also connect the filmmakers to different decision makers um, who could speak to other decision makers about the topic. And then also another type of partnership um, was with the Council on Foreign Relations and the, getting access to not only show the film but go on record media-wise so that um, the Council on Foreign Relations were able to curate a group of very important folks and then also amplify it through their own media efforts where there were interviews that happened as a result of it. And so the journey eventually led to an Oscar nomination, which we were absolutely thrilled by. That was not in the cards in the beginning. We just wanted people just to, to see the film and understand and care about what was going on there. But it really proved to be very um, instrumental to have these kinds of, first of all, partnerships with one another as media entities and a distributor, but then also use those resources to, to hit those different points of you know, communications, um, media relations, um, influ influencer outreach, as well as the impact distribution campaign, and then the Oscar nom was just the cream on top of like, maybe, maybe, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but then after that, of also seeing that the film is still in, in demand, still being um, shown, there's a lot that's happening in the educational space with a tour. Um, it's been to Yale, Harvard, Cornell, Georgetown, going to Northwestern. Uh, the World Bank has the Fragility Forum that's taking place or will be shown at. All these different things that show that there is life for a film before even when you think, maybe will someone possibly be interested in my film? To being recognized within the, the media, with audiences, and then thereafter. Wow. Um, I'll ask two more questions and then we can have some audience questions, but that's all incredible. You had a very, very busy past couple of years, I imagine. Um, <laughs> It's, it sounds like so much of that happened kind of after the film was made and in the process of distribution. Cynthia, there's a lot of filmmakers in this room. You know, you're a filmmaker on the stage. I'm wondering if you could talk about how, you mentioned earlier that you can you plant these seeds early, um, the seeds for this work later on. And I'm wondering what are your best practices and your tips to these filmmakers in the audience? How do you, how do, you do that? What do you do? Um. I think I try and keep the impact campaign like really rooted, you know, as filmmakers, we're, there's so many ways to go out there and make change in the world. You know, you can go into policy work, you can go into education, you can go into healthcare. Um, I think as filmmakers and as a filmmaker, what I really try and stay rooted in is like, what is the potential of this story? Like, how is this story going to be a vehicle for change? And what is that change? And I think it's unique for, for every story. But something that um, I have been confronted with often in um, developing impact campaigns and speaking with um, you know, folks who are um, advising or you, know, you, you get feedback on like, what should this campaign look like? And, and something that um, I really resist is when, when it's like, you know, well, you can have, a, have an email sign up or you can have a petition or you can you know, get people to, to somehow, you know, to, to give them your cell phone, give, give you their cell phone number and their email. And um, what I often kind of think is that, that the notion of like having, the notion of having emails or being able to have a big mailing list is different than the ability to actually change behavior and use stories as a way to change behavior. And so that's something that, that I feel like I really, I really always want to come back to is like, it's not about getting a huge mailing list. Like, that's great. You can email, you know, like 20,000 people about, about X, Y, Z. But like, 
how do you actually get them to come to the table and have an experience that's transformative? That means that when they wake up tomorrow morning after seeing your film, they're gonna make maybe just one choice differently in all the choices they make that day. Maybe they will say something to their peer after they saw that peer just get totally torn down by somebody else in the classroom. Maybe they'll just say to them, hey, are you okay? And sometimes that's it, that's change, like that's behavior change. And um, I think that, that that's what is exciting to me about, you know, like story, that, that stories can make people do that. And, and again, the challenge so often is just like getting success so often is just getting them in the door to see the story. Um, so I don't know if I yeah. answered your question no, correctly, right. but can I actually, can I ask you a question, Erica, in terms of talking about this question of like, what does success look like? Because, and I, and sort of putting on my like online harassment, you know, like online harassment shark, uh, always like, you know, seeing it or looking and finding it or whatever. But after I saw For Sama, I was online and I was really fascinated to see that one of the top stories that came up in the Google feed was from RT, which is the Russian state media. And in the film, for those who haven't seen it, Russia is very uh, aligned with Assad in, um, in the attacks against the protagonists in the film. And um, it was a total hit piece on the film. And it was, you know, I won't repeat it because there's no reason to repeat online harassment. Um, but I, I thought, oh wow, this is really interesting. Obviously Russia is being made very nervous by th this film and by the incredible exposure it's getting. And I was curious if you um, had to contend with that as kind of like an, an unanticipated consequence of having a very successful film is that you are also now responding to harassment and other attempts to sabotage the film or the message or the stories or the, in this case, in this piece, the really, the very identity of the protagonist at the center of the film. Uh, that actually did not come at us as a surprise. Yeah. Uh, there are other different attacks too. I think it's important to say that it's, it's par for the course when you're part of an investigative journalism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you're going to expose, that's the point of investigative journalism, is to expose, uncover, to reveal, and with that, not everyone is going to be happy about the truth. Um, and you know, that is the focus, is to have that tunnel vision of what we care about is revealing facts, of revealing the, you know, the verity of what's taking place. And, um, you know, how people respond to that, they do. Um, but it's important for us that the main thing is to have integrity in, in the work that you're doing. And that's what we stand by, knowing that there are some folks who will push back against that. And that's fine, too. Amazing. Um, I think we have around 10 minutes left. Are there any questions? Yes, in the front. Hi. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> um, so I'm a filmmaker in the uh, festival, and my it's a short on an unhoused um, San Francisco resident who provides medical services on the street. Mm -hmm. um, I have been, the whole point was to change behavior in terms of like the callous and sort of intolerant um, attitudes that have been expressed in San Francisco around homelessness. Um, every time it's in a, in a festival or any time I do a screening, people are really, really motivated to do something. I have a social impact page. I'm also doing everything by myself, and I'm also not getting the distribution super widely. Like, I've been in four festivals, and then I've done screenings beyond that. So my question to each of you is, um, and you can use your films as an example, I would love to have a uh, recommendation of a social justice impact campaign from a film that you think just nailed it, because I will copy them. <laughs> Can I? Yeah. Uh, the first one that comes to mind, which um, the filmmakers are very notable, and I think we're able to get tremendous support from fantastic folks, but one that if there is a case study that you can read up on would be The Visible War. Uh, I think that one has been <laughs> talked about a lot where they did a really good job of um, really being mindful of the different groups that would support the work they were doing with the film. And 
it looked to me that when that campaign was unfolding, because they were already um, partnered or collaborating with these different groups, that if they also had a meeting, let's say, with someone who is part of the decision-making realm, that they would activate those folks who were part of the grassroots group to appeal to those who were making decisions. And so I felt they were particularly effective in terms of addressing the issue of sexual assault within the military because of that mindfulness of, yes, they're filmmakers, and yes, they want to make a difference, but then designing a campaign in such a way that they're not doing all the heavy lifting themselves, but there are folks who do that day in, day out, that they were uh, smart to collaborate with and set certain goals and to be activated in a way that you, being the you know cook, waiter, you know <laughs> everything in between, that you can't take all that by yourself and so on by yourself and so that's why, in terms of the work that we do, it's very collaborative. You really do need a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean partners will be your best friends, and we haven't even talked about that, but they are key to really any campaign that you do, and those are the people that are doing the work around the issue already, and they're people that you bring in, and the earlier you bring them in, the better, and they are, yeah, your, your MVPs, and they continue and get it out at every step of the distribution. Um, and so there's also a lot of case studies if you want to read up on them. Um, if you look at, uh, Doc Society has the Impact Field Guide, um, so if you look up Doc Society, the Impact Field Guide, there's a lot of like kind of really wonderful case studies that you can kind of look, look at. But first and foremost um, is really getting partners on board to help you. Yeah. Maybe we should dive into that actually because I, I love that. And we always say, you know, a picture which we say a partnership is symbiotic. It should be a two-way street. Eliza, could you shed light on how, how, what does that partnership look like? What, yeah, what are mean, the asks? What, how does it help? Sure, yeah. I mean, I'm at the beginning of a, a campaign for a film right now, and um, the first step is kind of finding people that we think are going to want to use the film, they're working on the issue, um, and bringing them in, though, to watch it and say, how can you use this film in your work? Do you see a way to use it in your work? What would that look like? Do you want to cut it up and make clips and make a toolkit for... Um, for instance, the NCAA, let's use that example, right? Like, so it, it's about kind of asking partners how they can use this and how we can help them, and also then figuring out, you know, how they can help us get the word out about the film, fill seats um, at festivals and at, uh, you know, during the theatrical, and um, yeah, bring, you know, tweet about it the night of the broadcast and how do you kind of really elevate that conversation. Um, yeah. People need to be um, paying, like there needs to be more money on the table okay. here for this mm -hmm. work to be, to happen. Like, you know, we need partnerships that also come with an understanding that um, it costs money to pay people to create toolkits, to run a community screening program, to book a, a theater where you want to have 500 people from, you know, a community come see it. And, um, you know, I think films can do so much, create great exposure and to be tools for the work that organizations are doing. But, um, you know, I think the funding for that work is like, okay, like where's that gonna come from? You know, it costs money to create a strategy, it costs money to run a campaign, it costs money to develop the impact report that you need to give back to your funders so that they can say to their board, hey, look, we invested in something and it succeeded, thank you. Um, and I think that's sort of like the elephant in the room and what you're saying is really speaks to that is you're like, I'm the filmmaker, I'm trying to manage my impact campaign. I'm trying to build these partnerships. I'm trying to figure out, you know, if you're gonna go to a potential partner, you have to have a nice deck and a budget and, you know, show them what you're gonna do. How's that gonna happen? And um, I think that there needs to be a, a much greater sense of awareness for potential, you know, companies or brands or, or, or partners who, there's lots of partners out there who, who don't, who are in the same position we're in, which is like, they're hustling, they're like, we don't know how we're gonna pay our staff to do the things we need to do. We wanna use your film. 
And I think you have to think a bit about like what can different partners bring to the table and maybe those partners can't help support the financing of your campaign but they have a really really excited community who are really excited to get out there boots on the ground great that's kind of what that partnership looks like but let's say you're talking to you know a, a different kind of partner who has who's let's say a tech company who you know has some resources to work with here and let's say they're a tech company who's got some issues with, like, you know, have some problems with the things that are coming out in your film. And, and they want to look better by, like, okay, fine. You want to look better by getting behind a film that has, you know, these social justice components and, and can help you forward a mission of, of being a leader. You know, that should come with real support for the campaign and for the filmmakers and for the staff and for the tool development. And... Um, you know, I think all too often there's like, cr it's crumbs, it's crumbs. Yeah, and I always say you can go to IMDb Pro and see what foundations have funded some work, and whether yeah. it's, pr it's like the easiest way to cheat and, yeah. and do, <laughs> do your homework, but it's like, oh, you know, for foundation or Illuminate or Sandbox, if it, you, you identify the issue space that you're working in, if it's science, go to, you know, yeah. Sandbox. If it's press freedom, go to Illuminate. Um, it's a good workaround. But and there's foundations who are doing just awesome, awesome support. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've had great foundational support. I've had great foundational support from from for both projects from different from different yeah. entities. But more, really, more needs to be done. And brands and corporate sponsors and folks with deep pockets, I think, really, really need to be stepping up. Mm -hmm. I think that might be. If, if there's another question, uh, how about on the front? <laughs> Speak, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for speaking today. And each um, each documentary looks fascinating. Uh, my question is, what's been your favorite film to work on, and why? It's like asking for the favorite kid that you have. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard. And there's like 250 <laughs> of them. <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, no, it's really hard. Um, I, I actually, I love all the projects I'm currently working on. Um, but there was a film I worked on my first, my second year at POV called uh, Brother Outsider, an inspired Rustin story. Um, and that was an um, extremely satisfying campaign to work on. I don't have a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> but I, work, I enjoy working on different films for different reasons. I have um, a big heart for global affairs, so I do love for Sama, for shining a light on what's happening on the other side of the world. A big heart for our democracy and the idea that um, none of us should abdicate our citizenship, that we all need to be actively involved and engaged in our democracy. And so I appreciate films that I've worked on like Dark Money, which revealed what was happening with campaign finance. I'm very excited for another film coming up uh, through the work I'm doing now on voter suppression. So for different reasons, I love different films, but equally. <laughs> I think I can say. <laughs> um, I think we're out of time. I think one last question, um, because we are at the Athena Film Festival, and we've talked about this, Erica, before, and I, I love talking about this, but there's so much conversation right now about um, parity and equity in this industry and what that means for impact work and giving and we talk about funding. So what happens when we give a seat at the table for people who haven't had that seat before? How does it intersect with our work? So I know we're right out of time, but maybe we can all briefly speak to, to what that means um, because it intersects in so many different ways. Sure. Um, so in brief, that's hard. Um, <laughs> I've seen a lot where there have been films that are present about a specific character or different sets of people. And then when you go to the engagement screening, you really don't see those folks reflected in the audience or even on the panels. And it's very important that what you see on screen is reflected impact-wise in the actual event. I feel like it's an extension. And so, for example, with Forsama, um, there was a, a period in which the director who lives in the UK uh, could not come to the States. It's very important that her voice as a Syrian woman, 
a woman who's Arabic, a woman who is Muslim, that it gets extended into the conversation. And so one particular uh, program, uh, engagement program, I'm very excited about that it explored that was that um, there is a lot of intentionality that went behind curating the audience of who's coming in, making sure you're reaching out to those groups. And then also for the panel, uh, it was, the panel was moderated by uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists. And then the panelists were representative, such as um, a young woman who's a Syrian refugee and activist who uh, went through some very similar things that were seen in the film. Um, and created her own consultancy that whenever she speaks, she now speaks with NGOs that when you do work around refugees, you have to include a refugee voice in order to do that work adequately. Uh, also, a woman from the UNHCR who's of Lebanese descent, a woman who's Palestinian, who's from Jordan, who worked with Syrian um, women who are refugees. And seeing those three dynamic Middle Eastern women, their voices amplified was a moment I really felt um, that was very special because that's not commonly, they're not commonly given a space in which to shine. And so when it comes to parity and inclusion, I felt it was very important to, to cultivate something like that and, to, and for other um, engagement programs that I'm not directly involved in to make that something that the hosts who are doing screenings are mindful of as well. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's so important. Um, and there's a film I'm working on right now that's called Disclosure, Trans Lives on Screen, and um, it looks at the history of trans representation in film and television. Um, and everyone on screen is trans, that's actually telling the stories, and um, behind the camera as well, as much as possible, and when they couldn't, um, find a trans person, they meant they found somebody that would mentor a trans person. I am working on the impact campaign. Uh, the director is one of my best friends. We've known each other for 34 years. Um, but I'm, I'm working with a fellow. Um, and we're going to hire somebody else who's trans. And I would say that it's actually the field that we're in, I didn't get to talk about that, uh, but is growing, right? Um, and there is more funding coming in, and then it goes and it comes, so it's a, it fits and starts, but I would say that there's not enough people doing the work that we're doing um, with, with films, and I've seen in the two years that I've been um, kind of on my own, just like a growing need. Um, so I don't know, I mean, personally, I'm trying to figure it out. Like, I wanna do fellows, I want to do fellowships with many people, young people, and sort of just expand the field of people that are working in impact, because there's not, there's not enough of us, I don't think. Yeah. Um, I would just say, close in saying, and I think this has been sort of brought up already, but just really, you know, like, who's behind the camera and who's on the team, who, you know, really, who, who you're hiring, think about who you're hiring, you know, cinematographers, sound mixers, sound recorders, producers. Um, you know, it's not just about the stories that we're seeing, but also um, who's capturing those stories. And that's, I think, big for our industry. <laughs> well, thank you so much um, for being here, and thank you for being here as well. Um, and uh, have a wonderful rest of the festival. Thank you. Thank you.